Welcome to Trust the Journey. I'm Melanie Curtis. Our mission is to live, laugh, love, and learn together with you. We're here to create conscious connections, to grow and contribute through our practice of openness, honesty, vulnerability, humility, and trust. Trusting the entire journey. Across the internet, family, our handle is trustthejourney.today. That's our website, it's our Instagram, all the things. If you would like a way to support the show, you can subscribe on YouTube. You can follow us on Spotify, leave reviews or comments anywhere. A five-star review on Apple Podcasts goes a long way to help us reach more people. All the things, share with someone that you think an episode would help. All of that really, really helps us. So that is just Thank you for all of you that are doing that already. If you would like to join our community more directly, you can join the Trust the Journey family where we expand the conversation, our connection directly, and we really get up to integration and supporting each other in there. How to join is you donate in any amount on our Patreon and that you can reach via the website trustthejourney.today and that gets you right into that private Facebook group. If you want to connect with Jay or me individually, you can go to our websites, jasonmaletsky.com or melaniecurtis.com. Cool. All right. So today I have the absolute honor and I am super thrilled to bring on Anna Simons. Anna is a plant medicine advocate and retired women's premier rugby league, (laughs) women's premier league rugby player whose 20-year playing career includes championships in the United States and Australia. She also competed in amateur mixed martial arts. Anna is the executive director of the nonprofit Etheridge Foundation, which helps to fund research on plant medicine treatments for opioid use disorder. She is an active, she is also active with several other nonprofits, including Athletes for Care, The Last Prisoner Project, and the Concussion Legacy Foundation. I personally was lucky enough to get to see Anna speak on a panel about psychedelics and elite performance at the Psychedelic Science Conference in 2023. And given my experience at those levels, I was immediately drawn to go up to her and at least say hello, just connect. And now here we are. Anna, welcome. Thank you so much, Melanie. I'm really glad that we got to meet at the conference. And um, as soon as you invited me to come on the show, I was like, yes, let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. How are you feeling today stepping into this space? I always (laughs) kind of like to ask a very, very present, grounded uh, question right out the gates. Yeah, well, I'm feeling eager, maybe a little nervous because who knows (laughs) what we're going to talk about. Exactly. um, it's morning here in my time zone, and I've got, you know, I've had a little bit of coffee, which is always good for me. So I'm <laughs> ready to go. Yeah, I love that. And I appreciate you stepping into this space because we do prep guests ahead of time that this is meant to be a vulnerable space, meant to share our stories and really get to know each other, and that being our highest service. So thank you for that willingness. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to open up. Yeah, you're welcome. And, you know, I want to start first diving into rugby, honestly. I am very curious about that because I'm curious, how did you become one of the best in the world? Because Jay and I talk about that a lot relative to our experience in skydiving. And I'm curious both the onset of like, how did you get into rugby? How did you, it, it's something that's not talked about in America very much, at least not in my circles. And so I'm curious about how did you get into it? And then what was your path to becoming one of the best? Absolutely. Well, first I want to thank you for the kind compliments. Um, I think that, you know, I, I do have to say, um, one of the best in the world, oof, that's a little bit well, that's a little bit uh, of a over compliment, I, I feel. But um, but I, I have played at the elite level. And when you're at that level, you know who the best in the world are. I wouldn't put myself amongst the very best, but I am in that level playing with yeah. and against and competing with, um, you know, the, the elite tier. So, yeah, very um, cool. 
so yeah, as as far as rugby goes, it's still this emerging sport in the U.S. Um, and it's grown a lot even since the time that I started playing. You know, more than twenty years ago, um, I was an athlete all my life, and I played soccer, which I was. I don't know, a little obsessed with, I guess, <laughs> just being, you know, I played year round and, um, and I also ran track and, you know, when I was younger, I dabbled in some of the other sports, but, um, really high school, I sort of focused on soccer. And then, um, I went off to college and I was supposed to play for the team. I was doing preseason and, um, I got heat exhaustion during preseason, mm. and um, after that, I got cut, and oh. I was just devastated. You know, I felt like this was my plan. You know, I mm-hmm. everything had built up to this, and um, it was very uh, confusing for me. You know, my identity was kind of stripped very quickly as this. Yeah soccer player this athlete you know and and so I ended up transferring schools after my first year and I just thought oh the new school I'll you know I talked to their program I met with the coach and did my little tryout stuff and I was like okay you're you're on the team but I started I did an internship in the fall at a national park and then I started in the winter at the new school and they were they had had a losing season with a new coach and she was not happy. So we were just like running in the gym and being punished essentially. Yeah. And I was just like, this is not fun. And meanwhile, I was dating a rugby player and I had met uh, the, you know, the women's rugby team who they had just started their team that fall and they were so fun. And they were like, they were like, hey, want to go sledding? Let's go get this dessert and the cookie dessert like Sunday thing and you know they were just like awesome and so we went sledding we ended up tackling each other in the snow and I was like oh and they were trying to convince me you know come play on our rugby team I was like I have soccer but eventually I was just like I'm not here to be like punching bag I'm here to go to school and the rugby team's way more fun so I'm going to try this but as soon as I played rugby I was hooked and I was like oh where has this been all my life? Because it really suited me as an athlete and as, I guess, my temperament. Yeah. Much more than soccer. And, you know, in soccer, I was an aggressive defender, very physical, um, not so much like on the finesse piece. And, you know, I was a, an effective player, a good player, but, uh, you know, just the nature of soccer where you, Especially I feel like the bigger players get like get more calls, even if what you did was legal for being physical. They're like, oh, the big ones picking on the little ones sort of in women's sports. There's kind of that bias as well. Yeah. Um, or there has been historically. So to go to rugby and ha- and to be like, oh, you can just tackle that person. Oh, if they want to get the ball, they have to take it from you and you can, you know, not not stiff arm, but you can fend them in the face if they're trying to tackle you and you don't want them to you can run them over so it was this outlet for energy and aggression that was actually celebrated in yeah. women which was so freeing because we're not given that many outlets for for those kinds of energy as women it's you know so socially. so true um, so, yeah right i'm sure you have experienced your own share of of uh, gender issues in your sport, you know, just stereotypes and those kinds of things. But from our little, our humble little college team, we built some pretty, um, pretty excellent players and players who went on to accomplish a lot, including playing in World Cups and, um, you know, playing for national teams. And um, so... You know, after college, I moved to Portland, Oregon, where I played my club rugby for many years, pretty much just up through retirement, although I did have a little season over in Australia, which was incredible. Yeah. Um, And it's, man, it's been a commitment. Rugby was, but kind of still is, this huge part of my life. Um, You know, it was my friend group. It was my 
my passion and the thing that dictated my yearly, you know, schedule, everything. Um, and involved a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifice because women's rugby in the U.S. is not well funded. Yeah. So even when you're playing at the top level, you are still working uh, full time and you're, you know, fitting everything else in around it and you're expected to perform at that top level and we're pushing one another to do that but we're also doing things like you know not just focusing on our our skills our strength and conditioning all these pieces but also having to raise money for the team and yeah um you know help lead our organization so so those things are a challenge, but they're also an opportunity because it gives you a lot of other skills. Yeah, definitely. So basically the, uh, rugby just came into my life and like took it over. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Well, it's so funny. There's so much I want to talk of or touch on in what you just shared. The The whole notion of being the best in the world and what that looks like in different sports and this and that. Some of the best coaches in my experience in the realm of skydiving are not the actual world champions. They are the ones that are able to really dissect how the best in the world have gotten yeah. to where they are. Sometimes the best in the world can articulate that and communicate that and be a voice for the furthering of education and inspiration born from one sport, but not always. Right. Like, yeah, I have world records and stuff and I've competed at the highest levels as well. I have not won a world championship in four way formation skydiving, for example. So there's lots of different ways to perceive, I think, oneself as the best or whatever. I know for a fact I'm one of the best in the world in what I bring to my sport. And that's sort of like how I see you is that you're clearly being this beautiful, powerful voice for your sport, for women. It's funny, I just got interviewed for a different podcast talking about and weighing in on the pay equity progress that's been made in women's soccer. And so it's like even being able to talk about and be in that conversation and be able to just be another voice that says, this is m inspiring me to believe that this type of progress is possible at all and potentially in my lane and how can I be in service to that in my lane? So anyway, I see very much a lot of that in you, especially how you're being an advocate and this and that, like you are a, a voice of, for cannabis in your sport. And I'm curious, you know, that was a risk to probably become a public voice about cannabis. And I'm curious, how did you make that decision? What did it take and what has come from deciding to do that publicly. You're absolutely right. Um, it was a risk. And it came at a time where I was already working in cannabis uh, and I was still playing, but I was getting up in age, especially for my sport. Uh, I retired at age 40 and which is for women's rugby that's pretty old that's well beyond you know most players aren't playing that long <laughs> um beyond the average career but uh it was so it was a bit like I knew at a certain point I had been in contention I'd been to you know the tryouts and the camps for national team stuff and um and I'd Ha kind of had my opportunities and at a certain point I could see that I wasn't getting those invites I wasn't in contention anymore even if I was still playing well they wanted to invest in younger players understandable um, which is understandable you know uh, and so at that point I was like well at this point you know I I'm playing for me I'm playing for my team I'm not you know, realistically, I'm not in contention. I'm that doesn't change anything about the way that I play, but it does free me in a sense uh -huh. to be honest about these other things and to take a step forward and talk openly about the truth. 
which yeah. is plant medicines that are unfairly demonized and that help athletes and that shouldn't be banned, shouldn't be tested for. Um, you know, ca- cannabis was the first big kind of advocacy issue where I, along with, you know, Athletes for Care, there's, I don't know, more than 200 athletes, a part of that organization. And so a lot of us coming forward, but mostly retired. And so I was a little unique in that I was still playing um, my sport, but I also kind of knew the writing on the wall. Um, And so I had, I'd kind of weighed those factors out and sure. You know, another big thing though was was politics and um, the 2016 presidential election results made me feel uh, a lot of fear um, and a lot of desire to do something, which I think a lot of people felt. Um, And so my working in cannabis in the first place was almost my personal act of resistance, you know, publicly saying and putting it once it's on your resume, you know, that's going to follow you first. You know, some people might discriminate against that. Right. Um, But I sort of made the choice of like, well, then I am fine with giving up those potential opportunities because it wouldn't be a fit. Mm -hmm. Um, That's still scary, you know. (laughs) And so it was kind of that, that same kind of feeling where it's like, I'm going to put my name on this. You know, I, I need to talk about the truth and what's right and do my part. What has been some of the benefits of your decision to step forward and be that? Have, have any, have any unexpected opportunities come your way? Uh, I think so. Absolutely. There, I never had imagined before that I'd be speaking at events about this but yeah when you have a platform as athletes do um you should use it and so those opportunities have come up and i've been taking them and so that's taken me on this advocacy route and activist route that i didn't necessarily foresee for myself yeah yeah wow well that's amazing i mean i do think it's clearly a time in history with cannabis and with psychedelics where there is this wave, you know, and there are these early voices to be in service to these medicines. And I'm I'm curious about your own, this is sort of a kind of a sort of a left turn, but like what I want to hear more about your own spiritual journey, you know, because oftentimes people's experiences with psychedelics is connected to their spiritual journey. Maybe it is for you. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But clearly you've got you found your way to psychedelic medicines. But I'm I'm curious about that. Like what what would you say or how would you describe your spiritual journey and how it does do psychedelics? Are they a part of that if they are? Ooh, I love this question, actually. <laughs> I think it's so important. Um, The spiritual aspect of ourselves is part of our well-being. It's connected to our, our, you know, mental and emotional experiences and which are connected to our physical experiences. You know, they're inseparable. It's not to say that, you know, one has to have spiritual beliefs per se or, you know, a set of practices to be healthy, but just that there is a dimension of us, I believe, that, you know, can't be neglected. Um, so for me, it's, well, you know, the word journey, we're, I'm still on it. We all are. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay, it's, for sure. So I definitely <laughs> wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't present myself as like, hey, I figured it out and I have the answers. Oh, but my God. <laughs> the reason that so many of us want to share what we have learned is because um, psychedelics and plant medicines have made such a difference in in our journey and given us kind of leaps forward. So for me personally, um, like many people, most people, I've experienced trauma in my life, and some of some of that involves, you know, I guess an idea of 
forgiveness, you know, the fact of being harmed by someone, in some cases deliberately, in some cases beyond comprehension um, of how someone could be human and do such things, is a, a spiritual question. It's a spiritual challenge. So, um, you know, for example, um, I lost a good friend um, 13 years ago. She was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, Lindsay Babb. She was my rugby teammate, friend, um, and just an incredible person. And, you know, I knew him. We all did because he was with her and he came to everything. He came to all our events. He was at my wedding. I sure. uh, hugged him. He had been in my house, you know. Uh, and the manner in which he took her life was extremely brutal and horrific. And our whole community was was extremely traumatized. Um, so psychedelics and plant medicines tend to bring us into this realm where we feel a unifying connection with the with with everything you know all that is yeah and we tend to experience love you know like um ultimate universal mm -hmm. love underpinning mm -hmm. everything at, at least for me you know and i'm saying mm -hmm. we tend to these are my experiences and from what i hear from others they are you know also common to other sure. typical experiences so having those experiences leads me to grapple with well what is the nature of of what we term you know evil if we're all one um if love underlies everything mm -hmm. where does this fit in how does this square um and taking the next step what are my responsibilities as a human being or not even not even responsibilities what are my what is my next step on the journey of healing of my healing you know of our healing because when that happened it felt like like he ripped a hole in the universe like, this should not be allowed yeah. to happen. This shouldn't be possible. This is, mm -hmm. you know, this is, um, and I think anybody who's been through such a tragedy understands that feeling of life before and life after. Yep. You know, yep. and after is never the same again. Um, and so, so I, I, had a ceremony uh, a few several years ago with um, with Toad Five M E O D M T, and that was mm -hmm. a very intense experience. And it was one that left me. It felt like it powered me forward through some blockages um, mm. that I'd had in in my understanding of, I guess, the idea of forgiveness. And the insight that I had was that forgiveness was not within me. It wasn't something I had to do. It was something outside me and that I was standing in its way. Very. And if I would just stand aside, it would flow through. That's one thing to say, but it's another thing to really take action. I mean, so in the wake of that experience too, I was asking myself questions like, what does it mean to, you know, to experience like all encompassing love to feel that, you know, existing in, in each of us, in our molecules, our atoms, our energy, our, you know, our fibers of our being, you know, it felt like after that experience, it felt like I needed to take some steps to demonstrate mm. my, not demonstrate, but to live, you know, to actually live out and not just think thoughts, but to yeah. move myself forward. You hear? Um, and Embody. so I was able to do things like, you know, send send my ex-spouse a nice card, 
congratulating them on their new baby and <laughs> yeah um things yeah. like that were you know a little more i want to say mundane hurts <laughs> like normal human experience and sure i still haven't done anything about this one you know this mm -hmm. because i i just couldn't bring myself but i did ask myself what does it mean to to you know what would it mean to to move forward towards healing in this you yeah. know, would I need to talk to him? Would I need to help him in some way? And I don't think I'm ready to do that. Yeah. You know? And so engaging with, and I do think those, this type of a, a an issue is a spiritual question because it, yeah, it, it raises the very bedrock of, you know, of our human principles, and ideas of good and evil, of forgiveness, repentance. Um, can somebody be forgiven for an intentional, you know, an intentional act of a mind boggling cruelty and, um, and it's much easier to do those things in the abstract. You know, we can read stories about someone who maybe you know murdered someone when they were young and they made a mistake and they have been reformed and they've been in prison for 30 years and they do this and that to help others and when you're when you're outside of it you're like oh and i don't know you know i don't know mm -hmm. if he's done anything i i'm not mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. connected but but when when it's personal it just raises questions of what do i do or not do yeah and yeah how do you thank you try to for, heal something so yeah, yeah. I th I'm thank you so much for sharing that and I that's powerful I actually when I was listening to you share when I was hearing it feeling it I'm like this is very much an active part of your stepping into serving forgiveness energy and being embodied in it. I think it is very much a question. I personally don't think that there has to be active connection between someone a, that has harmed us or wronged us, quote unquote. And I know that's a judgment. I'm saying that sort of more broadly because of this conversation. But I personally, and this is just my opinion, people can take it or leave it. I don't think there needs to be active resolution in a singular lifetime if it's not there, if it's not ready for that. And for me, it takes me to this very larger spiritual question as well, which is there's no way at my current as my current self and my current being and the current embodiment, my current place of healing, that I can understand this. And so there's this vastness and there's this surrender into an unknown of like, I'm going to believe that in my caring about forgiveness and allowing for the pace and patience that that may take for me in this human form, that's going to be enough and I'm going to trust if other things are meant to come to me relative to this healing or or whatever. And and like you said, I love that you're leaning into other specific actions in other areas so that you can it integrate and practice. What does forgiveness look like? Let me take on something more manageable for myself because I'm not ready for this yet. That is such a powerful, powerful example of how to engage in our healing and do it with humility, with patience, and with love for ourselves, and a broader opening and surrender to what might be or might not be. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, I feel similar, Melanie, in that all I all I knew was that I wasn't ready. But the interesting mm -hmm. thing was that I was asking myself these questions and even considering this in a new way that I, you know, had not this like so much pain and hurt this was something that had been locked away you know and 
like put it behind a closed door because it's too painful and I can't, you know, I can't, I can't hold it all the time. But this allowed me to open the door and actually look at things and, and touch them a little. And that's how, you know, we heal ourselves is we start to heal ourselves by touching and engaging with our pain and our hurts. And yeah, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that necessarily the act of forgiveness is something I have to do. You know, again, it's mm-hmm. not coming from like something within me, but so, you know, I don't know the answer. This is part of the journey, yeah. but um, yeah, it's something that will keep evolving as life goes on. And I, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, tell us. So let's let's shift to the Etheridge Foundation, because obviously there are some strong I mean, not obviously but for people that don't know about it, but I would love for you to share the story of the foundation. Of course, share your story relative to the foundation, how you got involved. But what is the story? Why was it founded? You know, can you give us the background? Because it's it's connected very much to what you just shared. And, uh, you know, another example of building and creating things in our waking lives outside of our healing experiences with plant medicines of whatever kind we engage. Yeah, absolutely. So the Etheridge Foundation is a nonprofit founded by the iconic rock star Melissa Etheridge. Um, And I'm the executive director. We're a newer nonprofit. And our story, of course, comes from another sadness, another tragedy. Um, Melissa lost her son, Beckett, to opioids um, just over three years ago now. Um, And, you know, she wanted to do something with her, her pain. She wanted to transform it into action and to acts of love. And specifically, she chose to focus on helping to fund research that supports um, development of plant medicine treatments for specifically for opioid use disorder. So, you know, it's, and, and of course that the research is there, it's increasing. Um, there are for-profit, non-profit, you know, there's, there's all this research going on, but we see ourselves as a hub focusing specifically on this issue, the intersection of these medicines nice. and specifically opioid use disorder, right? So it's, it is a very, um, a very certain focus, but that allows us to pull in allies um, mm-hmm. to help drive research on this specific topic. And... Uh, well, you know, when Melissa talks about Beckett, she says he's non-physical now, but they're still mm-hmm. connected. Mm-hmm. Um, she has her own powerful experiences with plant medicines and their healing power, which is why she believes in them. Um, she knows, you know, she's been there. And uh, so, so doing this work is an incredible privilege because it's something I believe in and I'm passionate about and I get to spend my days, you know, working on that. Um, It was my advocacy that got me, you know, that got me the job that, you know, my my track record of activism in this space um, and and some other, you know, the double-edged sword of, of women's rugby having to work and so you're developing a resume while you're still playing and so you know it's tough but then also you have these accomplishments that you can point to you know demonstrated things when it's time for the next step so yeah it really did feel like everything kind of led into this this dovetailing of my passions isn't that fascinating how that works it's (laughs) How you think there's so there's such disparate things like skydiving, you know, I mean, it's just a, it makes no sense. Rug, it, it's but yet it totally does make sense because skills translate, right? How much did I have a microphone in my face when I was running events at skydiving drop zones? It was all the time. 
I was a public speaker since I was a teenager, basically, <laughs> you know, and so it makes sense uh, now that that's a yeah, part of yeah. how I serve the world. You know what I mean? It's it's like I've loved people my whole life, like just people are my thing. And it just makes sense that I now, I'm a life coach and I'm a person that writes about human experience. And I'm so, so deeply caring about healing and how can we help people heal and so when I hear stories like yours and I see you being an advocate in the way that you are, when I hear stories about Melissa and the Etheridge Foundation, I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah. That is people doing the work and and making accessible places for these conversations, for funds to come in, for you know, conversations to be bolstered by her star power and stuff like that, just like using the platform. But um, what, so can you tell us more how people can support it? I'm just curious, like how do people get involved with your foundation? Absolutely. Uh, well, you can learn more about us by visiting etheridgefoundation.org and it's E T H E R. I D G E foundation.org Etheridge. Sometimes people leave out that second E, but um, yeah. <laughs> and so our website has more information about the kinds of studies we've helped fund and the things we're doing. And of course, a link to donate, which is the lifeblood of what we're doing. Um, uh, you know, it's very expensive to do studies, clinical trials, and um, we often team up with other foundations okay. to get the fun, you know, the full funds to these groups. But um, you can, you know, you can kind of live out your values that way. If you, you think I support this, but, you know, say, oh, I have $10 to give. We'll gladly thank you for your $10 contribution. Yeah. It's almost like crowdfunding studies yeah. in a way that are focused on this specific issue. So if uh -huh. it's something that you love and care about, we, we, gratefully welcome all contributions. Um, and we are working on developing some more volunteer opportunities. We're cool. still small and we have to kind of figure out what that would look like for us. <laughs> uh -huh. But that is something we also have a place to sign up on the website for a future volunteer cool. opportunities if people are interested. Yeah. Well, and yeah, then of course be awesome. our friend on socials. We're on all the social <laughs> things and so follow us and, and that gives support because it helps us to spread our message. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. You know, okay, so I'm go I'm going to do another sort of 45 degree turn <laughs> in the question in the asking questions. Um because as a woman and you're we were talking about it sort of at the beginning, you're touching on it being a woman in sport, how women's sports are underfunded and this and that and I've done a ton of work with my skydiving activism and stuff like that around uh, you know, representation of women, both in our sport, but in media, in business, in government and all these places. Right. And so I'm curious what advice you would give to women. Yes, like bo all, all people. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious because you are a woman. How would you advise someone who is looking to make the transition from being maybe a professional athlete or simply making a career transition and going towards something that they're more interested or, or passionate about, maybe that's, it doesn't necessarily, the question doesn't have to be that narrow, but like I more want your thoughts on that type of, of career transition for people. Well, it is scary, isn't it? <laughs> and that's, you know, the, the saying that, um, courage isn't the absence of fear it's being afraid but doing it anyway uh -huh. um, it does take some courage to leap into the unknown or the partially unknown even um, I do think it's important if you don't come from economic privilege and you don't have that kind of a safety net you do have to be smart about your plan so you have to have uh -huh. some substance to it but at the same time the universe does seem to have ways of of catching you as well um sometimes you have to be patient 
sometimes you have to endure periods of uncertainty, anxiety, um, sacrifice. We heard. But sometimes you have to leap. You of all people know about that. And I'm sure I, I have no idea what it feels like to do what you do. But I don't know if you can even remember the first time you jumped out of a plane. If you, you oh, yes. might remember that. But oh, you've done yes. it so many times, right? <laughs> but, so there's, so if we use it as an analogy, it's kind of a good one, right? I mean, there's a preparation yeah. that's really important. You want to have your, your parachutes and safety, you know, your plan and your backup plan. Um, yep. But you have to, at some point, you have to let go and you have to do it. Um, you have to, you don't want to like timidly like trip and fall over the edge or, you know, you need to jump. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's as far as my technical knowledge goes there. But <laughs> in rugby, I always say like the times you get hurt is if you go into a tackle kind of soft, like you're, you're yeah. not, you know, putting your wholehearted, not full commitment. It's the one, the ones you go in full commitment, you're way less likely to get hurt. And it's the kind yeah. of that same thing too. So it's like make the leap completely, let go, um, but have an eye to where you're going next. Even if you don't know, you're yeah. looking. Exactly. It's so funny. I didn't actually mention, I've told you this per, I, personally, but I didn't mention it earlier. And I think this would be useful for the peeps listening to know that I totally played rugby in college. And I l was good. Like, I loved it. I have a, it's so funny. I have the same story as you. Well, same ish in that I was like a really great soccer player in, in high school. And then I started to play soccer in college because I'm like, well, you know, I want to be doing something and playing the team sports and yada, yada. And I just hated it for some reason. It was it was just not fun at all to play soccer. And so I I actually quit which was a kind of a big decision for my young self back then. I was not a quitter, quote unquote, all those things. And I found rugby after that. And it totally changed my college experience because I loved it so much. It was so much fun. It was social. And yeah, like obviously just lots of stuff around that. But anyway, I so I can so appreciate what you're saying about that sport because it does take something to be willing to be in a physical environment like that. And I think it's such a powerful parallel to what you're saying about you have to, you prepare, prepare, you build skills, you go to the gym, you build muscle, all the things, and then you have to actually do it. Um, the metaphor I often like to use is one that I, I learned very early in my entrepreneurial journey is you have to throw your hat over the fence, as in, I have to climb over the fence in order to get that hat back. So there's something I'm doing that's forcing me, that's forcing my hand, which is sort of kind of a powerful move as well. So if you need help, right, there's no getting back into the airplane. It's sort of that type of choice. It takes bravery, and I acknowledge that. So anyway, I love that share. Um, but yeah, is there anything, before we go into sort of not rapid fire questions, but I have a series of questions that I ask every guest that comes on. Is there anything else that you want to share before we go to those? I can't think of anything specific. I'm sure it'll come out. It's all good. Um, so, I mean, and again, so much good stuff. We'll put anything you want in the show notes. But so these, so these questions, this this list of questions is is basically a series of questions aligned with our values for Trusted Journey our core mission. So it's things that are going to touch on, you know, honesty and vulnerability and joy and love and learning and growing and all those things. Of course, hilarity. <laughs> so the first question is, what is something that has humbled you recently? Ah, uh, uh, I hate this one. Um, so I know. Aging. So I, <laughs> I've been dealing with for some reason, I was like this machine of, you know, of course you get injuries, but you do your, you know, power through your PT and your healing and you keep playing and you don't go out and you, you know, for years I was just 
And then I retire. And two years later, I've I've got like, you know, I go to the gym to lift what I think is a small amount of weight, hurt my back. I'm on the couch for two days in like intense oh. pain. That was like a, a few months ago. And then um, dealing with a pinched nerve in my neck that gives me tingles, like these things that never happened when I was younger and doing much yeah. more intense things. It's just like, what is this? It is an indignity and it is humbling. <laughs> You know, it's true. It's so funny, Jay, and I talk about this a lot. My my co-host on the show is because he, same thing, he's flying parachutes and this and that, and he broke his back a lot, and he's been, he's dealt with chronic pain a long time. We, I really want to have on a couple of guys that I met at the Psychedelic Science Conference where they talk very specifically about psychedelics and how they're serving to heal chronic pain and physical pain, because uh, the conversation for me is so much more centered around emotional pain and mental health and this and that. Anyway, I just more I'm like, oh, I want to open that up. And so thank you for sharing that because I think it's a very real experience for many. I am knocking on wood that I don't have any major things yet. I'm like, oh, what can I? Yeah. Oh, my God. All right. So the next question is, what is something that you are loving right now or j- that brings you simple joy? Uh, I love the ocean. Ooh. I am lucky enough to live in Hawaii. I moved here a couple of years ago. And uh, there are definitely, it's not necessarily easy to live here. There's a lot of things to it. Um, but for me, being able to go in the ocean, and it's that warm, beautiful ocean, clear water, um, something about the water is just this powerful medicine for me to put my body in there and I just no matter how bad I feel before that it just I always come out feeling better yeah oh I love that I love that there's so much I could add to that but I to keep it relatively brief I won't (laughs) (laughs) it's just like so good nature in all its forms. I tend to be so much a forest person. I feel similarly when I go into the forest where it feels like the trees really blanket me with love, which sounds so weird, but it's true. I love the forest. It's it's a cool. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Next question. What is something that you've learned recently or want to learn? Ooh. So I have been, I started and now I've kind of fallen off. Now I'm working on trying to play the ukulele. Living oh, here in cool. Hawaii. I wanna, you know, we were given one as a gift and um, <laughs> I started trying, you know, I went on YouTube and learned some basics and started doing some little stuff and I was coming along. And then I um, started coaching my local high school boys rugby team, and that started taking up some of my time yeah, that I'd yeah. been spending on that. But it is something that I, I want to get back to because I, I barely started, you know. But it's, um, I think, being able to sit and, and let your thoughts wander in the form of music, you know, to have like this out loud expression of just where your mind's going is this beautiful experience. Um, so yeah. I want to... I want to have that. I want to do more of that. Yeah, totally. And I, you know, part of the reason I ask these questions is because it's, I think we can, we talk a lot on the show about really deep stuff and, and like, God, I so value your sharing and your willingness to be vulnerable. And those things are so important. And the reason I, I bring us to things of like, what are we learning about or what's simple joy and the next question's about something funny or whatever is that in order to, in my experience, maintain and sustain a growth centered life that's that cares about healing, that's doing the deep work. Oh, the only way to sustain that in my experience is if we can laugh at how ridiculous life is and how ridiculous we are, how we can be delighted by something really simple, how we can have lots of things in our toolbox, like the ocean, like the trees, like writing, like the music or whatever. Those things like so matter. 
And so when I have someone like you on the show, I want you telling other people what simple things you engage with, too, so that people know it's not just you running a foundation and you being this fantastic professional athlete. You know what I mean? That it's like you're a human and there's so much humanness about all of us that it's like what makes the the greatness and the healing and the depth accessible. So thank you for that. Of course. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. Your question, what's something that's humbling and what's something you're loving? For me, there's a bunch of things that are just both. The ocean is yeah. very humbling. Yeah. And, you know, or even something like yoga, you know, you don't have to live in a near a warm ocean to like something like yoga that I love. And it's always very humbling. I'm not the most flexible. I've been doing it yeah. for many years and I'm still always like, <laughs> here we go. Oh my but God. It's so good for you, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I like I am, these questions. I am not. I am not the most flexible. <laughs> 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 and, and of course with yoga you're not supposed to go in with this like competitive mindset you know you're supposed to be like releasing and flowing and i i love that i, I am but there are there's still that part of me that core of me yeah. that you know what i mean looking out of the corner of your eye like like mm, they're better than me or like mm, i'm better than them and that's not you know that's not what you're supposed to be doing it just happens we're human like you said we're human we're human and you know being a high achieving person i like getting into the depths of things. I like be, you know, it's not that I necessarily have to be great at everything, yeah. but I, I am so interested in in anyone and anything that like with a depth of knowledge, because seriously, you people I talk to think skydiving is just like, oh, you just fall out of an airplane, right? Which makes sense. If a person doesn't know about it, they wouldn't know that you do this with your with your toe what? and this happens or That's you know what, what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I mean, there's so many things and, you know, it makes sense. I get it. I get it. But my point is like there's so it's so interesting to me when you get into the like the details of stuff. It's just like, oh, I really like that. Mm. That's why I'm so called to high performing people because yeah. that's required. You get into the real nitty gritty of what things are like and why they're interesting uh, and uh -huh. all, all of that stuff was very, very curious to me. So anyway, dovetailing off of that, off of these laughs is basically the next question is kind of a hard one sometimes to answer, but it's what was the last thing or something that made you like belly laugh, if you can remember, which is kind of almost hard to answer sometimes, but hopefully it's something yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this is a little bit, hmm, a little crass. I thought, do it. That's all right. Yeah, do it, girl. So, OK. And I'm going to I'm going to bust up some some more gender stereotypes. Love it. Love um, so it. the other day I was laying in bed, uh, my cat was laying nearby and uh, I farted, <laughs> which of course women don't fart. So I don't know how this Never. happened. Right. But so I farted him and, and my cat sits up to attention, looks around. And then my cat goes over to my butt, like puts her head right up and is like looking like where'd that noise come from? And then she starts pawing at my butt. Like right, right at my butt crack. Um, like she's trying to catch. I don't know if she, the frog that was in there or whatever she thought. So, and I was like, ah, ah! and then of course I was laughing, belly laughing. So, um, oh my god, that's a pretty embarrassing story. But that is amazing is. and hilarious because yeah, we are the only two women on the planet that fart. Everyone else clear no. <laughs> <laughs> but oh my god my cat is th the most hilarious thing I think in my existence I mean her thing for me is like bringing live and dead and or alive mice oh. into my room at three in the morning it happens all the time all the no. time she's like she's like mom uh, check this out uh, yeah yeah it's it's she bad. loves you I've got it down <laughs> yeah. she loves me I've got uh. it down to a science I bring the you know waste paper basket in I put it over the mouse it's like a whole process <laughs> oh I know Aww. okay so last question we're coming down to the wire 
And this one is around positive change in the world. And it's basically a very simple question in the sense that if you could initiate a positive change in the world, what would your vision for that be and why? And I I don't it doesn't have to be like this is the thing that saves humanity. It can be something small that you believe in. It can it can be either either whatever scale or or size you want, but what is that thing that you would invite people to start considering or or living into? Oh. Ah. This is a tough one because where do I begin? <laughs> there are many I things know. I change. So many. Um, I think for me something that I think about on a daily basis that concerns me is um, human impact on the rest of the living world and um, essentially how we're destroying it. Um, And if I could change something, it would be, you know, it would be some of those larger systemic things that um, of like the way we live, you know, yeah. things like our our disposable culture, our culture of consumption mm-hmm. um, instead of regeneration and, you know, the way that we waste. Um, there are so many ways we could be better without even changing much. Yeah. Um, just by caring more, it feels like. Um, you know, like you have this connection to nature. So many of us do. I mean, we're part of it, but we've divorced ourselves from it and Mm -hmm. separated and alienated ourselves. And we, our way of living as, as a whole, as humans, although, you know, different cultures are at different levels of this, is, is going to make our planet uninhabitable for life if we don't Mm -hmm. change soon. Yeah. So, yeah. And if people start to care even a little bit. It takes collective will, but. Yeah. On a mass scale, like you said, collective will. We're a collection will. of individuals. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But it, yeah, well, it, starts, I, it starts with individuals, but so sorry to be depressing. It's something that I think about. No. You know, all the no, time, like no, so many of us do these days. Well, that's, you know, I th- in my experience with activism, I was just talking about this yesterday with my business partner, Amy, and one of my best friends. And we're, we work together on some of our activist efforts. And it's in my experience with activism, you and even just growing up and like getting older, you start to really learn how much there is that's fucked up. And I say that not in a I don't mean that to be depressing either, but I mean it to Uh. for people who want to be in service that it's okay to pick the things that you are most called toward and to work toward those things, you know, and it's uh, it's hard to choose because I can feel like an a-hole for ordering something off Amazon You know what I mean? And then I'm like, oh, okay, just like maybe order less or whatever. Like try to invite myself into that while not beating myself up so much that I can't engage or I use that energy that I'm able to really put toward, for example, my advocacy for psychedelic legalization and that stuff and my advocacy for women and women's rights and stuff like that, equality at large. So I, I hear you and I appreciate yeah. you sharing what matters to you. That's what we want to hear about. Yeah. And you're exactly right. We can't fight every battle at once. Um, but I think this is to going back to psychedelics. This is where, you know, they have this power to offer people transformative insights and potentially helping us to change some of the ways we do things in these bigger systems. Because, yeah. like, you know, yes, our individual behaviors add up, but it's very hard to act differently when you're inside a system that's set up to keep us doing the same things. Uh-huh. You know, so it's changing the systems that will really make a difference. And to have the vision to do that, you know, 
maybe we could use some help from our our plant and fungi friends. Yes. <laughs> well, Anna, I think that's kind of a perfect place to to call it and to to close up. I just so appreciate you, like I said, and how all that I acknowledged you for in the beginning is just like, thank you for using your platform and your voice. And thank you for your willingness to step into this space and share yourself like your real self. It's like I I believe deeply that that is our highest service and absolutely what's going to make the biggest difference in the world. So thank you for that. And before we close, definitely, how can people reach you? How can people connect with you? How can people support you and the Etheridge Foundation? I know you said it again, but please tell us all the ways and then we'll say goodbye. Yes, etheridgefoundation.org. Uh, we're also on all the socials. You can find us. And I'm also Exit Drug on Instagram. That's my my personal one. So feel free to follow me on there and be friends. Yes, let's be friends. I love that we have connected <laughs> and I'm so grateful. And I'm just, yeah, we will be sharing this widely. And everybody listening, thank you for being here. As always, our stuff, trust the journey that today. But if you got value from this episode, please share it with someone. You know, share it with someone, follow on the socials, all those things. And we love you so much. <laughs>